because I want people to understand that this life is something that they set up. They designed it. So blaming anybody, oh, my life is the way it is because of my parents. Well, it's not. You sort of set this up yourself. I am here today with Joanne DiMaggio, and she is an internationally recognized researcher, teacher, author, and past life therapist. And today we're going to talk about her research on reincarnation and her experience with past life regression. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're so welcome. All right. So we'll just go for it. So could we start out by having you share a little bit of your personal story and how did you become interested in the topics of reincarnation and past life regression? Sure. Well, that goes back quite a ways to when I was uh, a child, a teenager. I I grew up, uh, I was raised Catholic, went to Catholic school for 12 years, but there was just something that was gnawing at me it it the whole idea of sin and then going to confession and having it all taken away um making it okay you know not okay but you know that your soul ended up being uh, squeaky clean after a confession it didn't it didn't feel right to me i i had a lot of questions you know well why are some people wealthy why are some people poor why are some people healthy why are some people sick why do some people struggle with money others don't why do why do some people have great relationships and others don't so those kinds of questions you know weren't being answered and so by the time i was a teenager i started to explore uh go to the library and and pick out books and i i happened to read a book um the very first book i read on reincarnation was the search for bridie murphy and this came out sometime in the late 50s, I believe. And that book just fascinated me. And after that, I couldn't get enough. I would go, again, to the library. I would read everything I could, you know, by the leading authors of that time. So it was like Ruth Montgomery and Jess Stern. And and I started to learn about who Edgar Cayce was. uh, And that was fascinating for me. And so I just found it satisfying. I found that the idea of karma made a lot more sense to me than the whole concept of sin. So I I didn't change what, anything I was doing. I, I, you know, except that now I had all this additional information. Well, fast forward, um, you know, up to 1987, uh, I pretty much had forgotten about my my deep interest in, in reincarnation by then. I was married. I had a few children. I was living in the suburbs of Chicago, leading a fairly normal mainstream life. And then suddenly, um, Shirley MacLaine's book, Out on a Limb, became a miniseries on ABC. They ran it in January of 1987. And to me, that was my, the big wake-up call for not only myself, but for thousands of sleeping metaphysicians all over the world. And suddenly, like she talked a lot about reincarnation in that in that miniseries and in that book and then in the miniseries. And uh, 1987, that was the year that I uh, got back into into this whole line of thinking. Um, I joined Edgar Casey's uh, Association for Research and Enlightenment, which is in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, the, for your listeners who don't know Edgar Casey, he's considered the um, the greatest, most renowned psychic of the 20th century. He did 14,000 readings, uh, and over 2,000 of those readings were um, life readings, which contained past life information. So I began studying uh, Edgar Casey and became involved in in the ARE met some extraordinary people. They were bringing in past life therapists from all over the country. I got to meet them. I founded my own past life research and education organization when I was living outside of Chicago. It was called Plexus. And I was then bringing in speakers who were talking on this subject. A little bit later then, I um, uh, I was involved with ARE. I was involved with Plexus. 
and but I wasn't doing regressions. And one of the speakers who came is Henry Leo Bulldog. He's since passed. He said to me, you know, Joanne, you know more about past life than about 95% of the therapists that are out there. Why aren't you doing this work? And I said, Henry, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm, I'm a researcher and a writer. I don't do regression therapy. He goes, well, you should. So he kept on me and kept on me. Finally, I did get my uh, certification as a, as a hypnotherapist. And then I started doing uh, the regression work myself. The uh, clients that I had, uh, or volunteers, if I was going to do a, a research project, and then from those research projects, um, I, I, I started writing, excuse me, my books. I also got my master's in transpersonal uh, studies, which is now transpersonal psychology from Atlantic University. Uh, and, um, and so I just was supplementing everything that I knew with anything else that was out there that I could get my hands on. And so now over the years, you know, I've come to this point where, um, I've, I've written, you know, five books on the subject and speak about it, uh, at conferences. And I have a, a global clientele that I do regressions with them, um, through zoom. So, uh, which is, you know, COVID had, if it had one positive aspect, it was that, that we were able to uh, connect with people all over the world who, um, who are seekers who are asking the same questions that everybody else is asking, you know, basically, why am I here? What's my mission in life? And we do get that answer through regression work. It's very powerful. And I'm very humbled by the, um, by the response that, that folks get when they, when they search their past lives. Wow. So Joanne, what you're telling me is that you, I mean, you have a lifetime of research and work in this subject, probably have more knowledge and experience than anybody that I've talked to. And the topic of reincarnation itself is so vast. I mean, we could literally talk about it for hours and hours and there's so many directions we could go, but maybe we should just like dive into the deepest question that everybody wants an answer to and it's why are we here why are we living these lifetimes on earth oftentimes over coming back over and over why are we doing this yeah well you have to think of yourself as a spiritual being having a physical human experience okay so we all started out at the same time uh at the time of creation um Originally, according to Edgar Casey, you know, we would come to Earth like it was our vacation. It was spirit's vacation spot, right? Oh, this is such a cool little planet. It's so pretty. We'll come here. But we started to get a little cocky and got sort of caught up in the physicality of the planet. And so, um, at some point, and and I'm not an expert on the re on the uh, creation story. It's something I do want to get into at some point. But we decided that we wanted to have these human experiences which we couldn't have in spirit so um so we started coming i think of earth as a school so uh i think of us as, as souls that are uh working with our our guides our our the ascended masters or, or angels whatever you want to think of them those are our, like our guidance counselors and so we meet with them prior to coming into any given incarnation and decide what is it that we're going to work on? What is it that we need to experience on the earth that we could not experience in any other way? So what happens is, you know, starting from the beginning of time, you start to accumulate karma. So things happen. You might have done something to somebody. They may have done something to you. That needs to get balanced out. You need to resolve it or heal it. And so you bring that with you into subsequent lifetimes. So it's like going to school, all right? You have a curriculum, you're gonna work on X, Y, and Z that particular year of school. If you pass all those courses, you don't ever have to take them again, right? But if you don't pass them, you're gonna to have to repeat them at some time. So you'll repeat them in another incarnation. The goal is to get back 
to where we started, get back to spirit, get back to the creator. Uh, and um, we're having all these experiences along the way and we're learning, learning, learning. And um, and that's what it's all about. I mean, there are many, many people who don't need to come back anymore. It's your choice. But most of us uh, are repeating life, a lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And, um, you know, depending on how we leave the uh, earth, uh, you know, some people like if you if you're a suicide, if you were killed in a war or you were murdered, chances are you're going to come back almost immediately because it's like dropping out of school. You didn't finish that class. You got to come back and do it. My research shows the average is 50 to 200 years earth years between between lives so when i do when i do uh, regressions with people some of them will go back a thousand years um they've waited that long to work on a particular issue uh, because this was the life in the here and now that was ideal for working on that particular issue so um it's really quite fascinating um the way that it works uh but people who you know i'll, I'll take them back to the lifetime that's most impacting them now Okay, so you've had many, many, many lifetimes, but you're not working on all of them. You're only working on one in particular where you had some karmic issues come up. And you decided, oh, now that I'm, you know, now that I'm Melissa, I'm going to work on this uh, in this life. And so um, and then you have your soul family who said, OK, I'm going to come in with you and I'm going to work with you on that as well. I'm going to play this particular role in your life. So it's it's. Um, it's very, very fascinating, uh, and it's also very powerful because there is tremendous amount of healing that goes on once you uncover the origin of the issue that you're working on now. Wow. Okay, so thank you for sharing that um, origin story, I guess we could call it, from Edgar Casey. I had never heard that before. So I'm curious, um, as somebody who interviews near-death experiencers, I will ask them this question, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? And the answers tend to fall into two categories. One category will say that we're here because we need to grow as souls and we come here to learn lessons and evolve spiritually. And then the other category will say, we're already perfect as spiritual beings. We don't need to learn anything but we choose to come here for the experience. Where would you fall on that spectrum? You know, there's truth in both of those, I think, really. Um, you know, yeah, you are a spiritual being, therefore, you know, you are perfection. I mean, the creator, if you have a, a perfect creator, the, uh, that creator is not going to create something that's less than perfect, right? So that part's true. But as I said earlier, we've chosen to come into a human physical body and therein lies the, the issue um, in that um, we, we have free will and we make choices and those choices may take us down a rabbit hole. They may lift us higher and higher and higher, or they may cause us to stagnate. Casey used to use the term, when he would talk about a past life of, of someone he was doing a reading for, he would say, in that life, the soul gained, or in that life, the soul lost. So it isn't that you're climbing this ladder and you're going up and up and up. It's You may go up, up, and then take a little detour and go down a little bit and then go back up again, depending on what you're, you're working on. Um, so I think it's a little of both, really. Um, the first one that you mentioned, I, I mean, I see us, like I said, I, I use the metaphor of us being on, we're on the earth, you know, as a school, we're going to school. I see us as little souls when we're in spirit, get our little backpacks on, you know, and then um, the creator says, well, you might, you know, run into some problems when you're, when you're down there and don't forget to, con to contact us because we're here 24 seven waiting to answer your question, which is what I say when I teach people soul writing, that's a way of communicating with spirit um, every day at any time of the day to get answers to any question you might have. So we do have help. We do have, we do have a source of, of continuous help, uh, but many of us don't remember that and we don't ask for it. So, um, but it's there nonetheless. 
So, um, you know, yeah, I think it's, I think there's many, many reasons we're here. And I think for each individual soul, it's, it's whatever they feel they need, uh, you know, to move up, to go forward, to be able to finish this incarnation and then go back to spirit permanently. Okay. So you mentioned the topic of karma and how you prefer that over the concept of sin that you were taught in the Catholic Church. Could you share with us the difference and what your definition of karma is? Karma is merely uh, cause and effect. It's reap what you sow. Every thought, word, and deed is recorded. It's like the universe's supercomputer, all right? So that's all kept up there. Um, so it's not like you can escape it. It's there. Karma is, I've done this, this is the consequence, this is how I'm going to fix it, this is how I'm going to repair it, this is how I'm going to come back to center. Um, so there's no, I, I tell this story, and I hope I'm not going to offend any uh, Catholic uh, <laughs> listeners, but it's like when I was about 12 years old, I went and saw a movie that the church at that time said was a a B movie, which anyone my age was not, it was, it was gypsy with, with um, Natalie Wood. I'll never forget this. And so that was, that was considered a, a sin to have seen that movie. So then you go into the confessional and you tell them the sin, they give you so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys. You say that and then it's poof, it's gone. You like it never happened. Karma doesn't work that way. Karma may, karma, you will, um, it will come back to deal with one way or the other, whether it's in this life, the next life, the life after that. So to me, that is the ultimate justice system because it's like nobody's getting away with anything. There is consequences to everything that you do. And it can't be whitewashed. It can't be just sent away or said, you know, prayer and, and poof, it's gone. So I... Um, that made more sense to me that, you know, and, and the other example I, I would give is like when I was a child and I walked to and from school. So lunchtime we would walk home and then walk back. And I thought, what if I was in a crosswalk and I got hit by a car and it was a Friday. And at that time you couldn't eat meat on Friday. So what if I had a ham sandwich for, for lunch and then I got hit by a car and then I would go, I would go straight to hell because I, I had eaten meat inadvertently. I forgot. And I didn't get a chance to go to confession. So that sort of thing just didn't make it. I thought a really loving, just God would not do that to his creation. So like I said, um, and there's a lot more to it. I'm, I've simplified it beyond measure, but there's a lot more to it than that. But still, it made more sense to me. It's it's the whole thing, the whole cause and effect uh, idea of karma makes a lot of sense, I think. Thank you for sharing that. I also I was also raised in a Christian background, and so I had some of the same concerns and like things just not not seeming fair and just and not really making sense. But here's a question for you. I've heard in some spiritual teachings or some near-death experiencers say things like, we can clear karma through forgiveness so that if somebody does us a wrong, we can free them through our forgiveness of them, or they can free themselves through forgiving themselves for what they did. Is there any truth to that, um, to avoid like getting stuck in the cycle of karma um, to use forgiveness to sort of free each other from some of that? Absolutely. There's the law of grace. So really, it's all about how do you approach the karma. I have met people who are dealing with karma that is, is very difficult for me to watch them go through it. They may have mishandled money in a previous life, and so now they're destitute. They may have done something to someone and then that person reappears in their life now. So they have a chance to, to resolve that in the, in the interaction that they have. I always include a segment on forgiveness when I do a regression that has to deal with chronic illness. So if a client comes to me and they've got some sort of a chronic condition and they have looked at every uh, medical 
reason for it. They've exhausted the traditional medical route. We go back and see if it came from another lifetime. And if it did, often when they can let it go, forgive themselves if they need to forgive what they did and forgive the others around them who may have caused this. It lifts it and it does dissipate it. So yes, that is one of the ways to resolve uh, karmic issues, forgiveness. Wow, that's beautiful. Where in your opinion is all of this heading? The lives that we're living and the spiritual growth that we're going through, what value does it have to us as souls? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's still not a huge percentage of people in the West who believe in reincarnation. Uh, it's pretty much common in the east part, eastern part of the world, but not here so much. Um, that's because there's a misconception about it, um, you know, from our Christian upbringing. We think that if we if we embrace it, that we would be um, going against the religious teaching that we've that we've embraced all of our lives. Um, I've always said that if everybody believed in reincarnation, and if in fact we are getting more toward that now, that there would be no way in the world that you could be a racist. Because you have been, you've been every race that there is. You, in all of your lifetimes, you've switched. You could have been, you know, Indian or African American or Chinese or uh, you know um, South American or anything um, other than the Caucasian European background that you have now, you chose that. So if you say to yourself, in my past life I was part of the enslaved community, and you remember that then how can you possibly have any racist feelings about anybody? Because you've already, you've, you've there but for the grace of God go you, right? I mean, you've been that person. So understanding that on a global scale, I believe would, would result in, in absolute harmony and peace because we would all know and we would finally understand that we're all part of the, of the f human family, that spiritually we are all connected. We're a chain. We're connected, you know, one to the other, to the other. To, I don't mean a chain in, bad, in a bad way. I mean that we're connected that way. Um, and if you look at life like that, don't look at the person's race or nationality, or religion, or any of that, because you could have been that in a previous life, or you could be setting yourself up to be that in the next life, you know? So if you look at people like that, look at the essence of their souls. Just look at the essence of their soul, not the, the physical that you see in front of you. And re relate to them that way, I think we would live in a whole different world. And I, I'm hoping that that's where we're headed. You made a really interesting point at the beginning about how it's hard for people to accept. I've noticed this, especially in the religious circles I was raised in. And I think it's because as Christians, we're taught that we're going to heaven forever. No matter what we do in this life, if we accept Jesus, then he takes all those consequences for us. So we just get to go to heaven forever. And so it can be hard for people to accept the fact that Maybe I do have to take responsibility for the consequences. Maybe I do have to experience some of those consequences. Maybe I'm not just going to hang out in heaven forever, but there's still going to be further work and growth to do after this lifetime. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, reincarnation was in the Bible mm. until the um, about the fifth century when they had the... Um, Council of Nicaea, they took it out. They took any reference to it out because it was a control factor. If you thought you had more than one ch chance at this, you might approach life completely differently. So, but the the fear of going to hell, uh, you know, was the, the church could control people that way and and keep them in line that way. And so, but and that's a whole other topic about 
reincarnation and Christianity. Um, but there's been many, many books written about it. And um, there's just so much evidence going back thousands of years about how long the whole theory of reincarnation has existed and what cultures it has existed in. You know, some cultures believe that you would reincarnate in the same biological family that you're in now, whereas others like Casey would say, no, that isn't true. You you change you change families, you change ethnicity, you know, you ch because, you know, how boring would it be if you just were the same lifetime after lifetime after lifetime? You know, I look at my grandchildren and I'll go, who are you? Are you somebody that I knew before? Um, yeah, but maybe not in this biological family. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful that things will change. And and based on the people that I talk to, such wonderful, loving souls are out there, uh, and they're they're searching. They're they're searching, and uh, and the emotion that comes out in a regression is also very cleansing and very healing for them. So, um, and even if it's something they think that they can't handle, spirit doesn't send you anything you can't handle. So the th issues that may come up in a regression may elicit emotion because that's the sign that it's a true memory. I can't make you cry when I'm working with you. Uh, and, and so they get that aha moment and, uh, and an understanding on a very, very deep, profound level. There's no price tag on that. There's, you know, that is like the ultimate healing. So um, so I'm very, very passionate about this work and especially about how it will impact the world if it were embraced by everybody. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the life between lives. Is that something that you deal with in your regressions? I wow. offer... I offer people a session with a pre-life planning. Okay. Uh, and so what I do is I take them back to the past life that's most impacting them now. Mm -hmm. Then I bring them back to their current life. And then I back them up. So they get younger and younger and younger. They go into, they become a baby. Then they go into their mother's womb and then out again. And then we see how they plan their current life. So in that session, you know, we talk about what does it feel like to die? What does it feel like? What, do you see something like a welcoming station or a gateway? Is somebody there to meet you and take you around? Uh, do you meet up with members of your soul family? Uh, you meet up with your council of elders, which again is the, the equivalent of a guidance counselor at school. You decide what are my karmic issues? What am I going to work on in this next life? You get that list, then you get a list of the karmic attributes you have. These are the positive things that you've acquired over all of your lifetimes that you bring in with you to help you deal with these karmic issues. We talk about what's your soul's mission going to be in this life. So you, by the time we get to that, they can usually say it in one sentence. You know, uh, like my, my soul's mission is to inspire and empower through the written word. Uh, and so some of them will say, I'm, my mission is to be a peacemaker or to be a teacher or to, or to be a builder, something like that, or to be an artist. Um, and so um, we then look at why did you pick your parents? Because that's our choice. Our mom and dads are people that we picked. And we picked them because of a number of factors, including what's the socioeconomic conditions that I'm going to be born into. So you know ahead of time where you're going to be, what, you know, what nationality you're going to be, what ethnic background you're going to have, what religion you're probably going to be brought up into, because, you know, whether you're going to go into a, a poorer family or a more wealthy family, all of that is pre-chosen by you. Because I'll ask people, okay, who did you choose for your mother? Why did you choose her? What lesson did she teach you? that no other woman could have possibly mm -hmm. taught you. So we look at that. And that's a wonderful thing because as a parent, then you can always tell your children, hey, you picked me, <laughs> you know? Uh, so then we look at members of your soul family and one by one they'll come forward and they'll say, yeah, I'm gonna come in with you. And when I do, I'm gonna be your grandfather and I'm gonna teach you this. My role is gonna be this. Uh, all of which, when, when you lay out that soul's mission, 
your soul family knows exactly what you want to accomplish when you come back to earth. And they're going to play a role to help you accomplish that, whether you perceive of that as positive or negative, they're still going to offer you that lesson. So it's, um, it's, it's a really in-depth uh, session. It can last up to three hours. Uh, and it'll give people, people will see, I mean, I, after I did my research on that very topic, I wrote a book and I called it, I did it to myself again, because I want people to understand that this life is something that they set up. They designed it. So blaming anybody, oh, my life is the way it is because of my parents. Well, it's not. You sort of set this up yourself. That's part of that self-responsibility that we were talking about earlier that gets involved with, with karma. So, um, yeah, so I do work with, with, uh, with clients who want to see that aspect of their soul's journey. Okay, so we hear a lot about why people may have planned really difficult lives. Um, I, something I've been thinking about more recently is why is it that people would plan an easier life? What value is it in having, not that any life is really easy, but maybe people who are born into money and just have it good. Because they may have not had it so good the previous life. Mm. Oftentimes when people deal with a very challenging life, uh, that has a lot of difficulty in it, a lot of suffering in it, maybe. Um, they choose to come back and take it easy, have a vacation between, because they know maybe in the life after that, they're going to jump right back in again. So those are like what I call vacation lives. And, um, you know, I've had clients who nothing has happened. When I say, what's a significant event? that happened in that life that created the karma you have now. There's nothing. They're just happy. They have a wonderful family. They're loved. Their needs are taken care of. They have friends. It's a great life. And then, you know, then it ends. And if I'm sure if we went back to the life prior to that one, there would have been a lot of struggle in that one. So that's how I look at it. So you earn you earn that life. It's like, like I said, it's like going on vacation, which is why we were coming to the earth in the first place, you know, was to go, go on vacation, enjoy the mountains, enjoy the ocean, enjoy uh, the beauty of this incredible planet. Uh, so every once in a while we get a little bit of a respite and spirit says, yeah, go have some fun. And we'll, we'll talk when you get back. <laughs> mm. I look at it that way, at least. And that, that's the way it seems from the clients that I've had over the years. That really highlights the importance of not judging people based on their life circumstances. There's a lot in our world today about um, recognizing our privileges, which I think is extremely important. But also the opposite is important too, to not judge people for being privileged in some way or for having it easier in some way. And, and a lot of uh, truly advanced souls that have, when I say advanced, I mean they've just been on the earth a lot more than others. Um, you know, you've heard the expression old souls. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as an old soul because we were all created at the same time. I think the reason that that phrase became popular is because you may see somebody that, like, especially if it's a child, oh, they just have so much wisdom at such a young, how can they can play the piano like that at such a young age? Well, those are karmic attributes they've just brought in with them. The more you come to earth, the more you know, the more knowledge that, that you have. You may decide, I'm gonna come in with a physical challenge for my, but this is not for me to deal with, this is for my parents. I'm coming in and then the, the, the whole karmic setup is how are your parents going to react to you? How are other people going to react to you? We shouldn't judge people like, like oh, if you see somebody that has a challenge like that and say, I wonder what they did wrong in their past life that now they, you know, now that they have this uh, a physical challenge that they're dealing with. It could be just the opposite, that they just volunteered to come in because they knew their parents um needed uh, uh, a lesson so that yeah so you're right yeah the, the whole idea of judgment is and even when you pass over and you go before the council of elders 
and you're reviewing your past life, they don't judge. A lot of people will say, what does the council chamber look like? And they'll say, looks like the Supreme Court. And they're wearing robes. That whole idea of judgment permeates our thinking, but that isn't the way it is at all. Uh, you know, it's like, um, okay, well, let's, let's figure this out. Let's plan this out so that you get your soul can advance uh, after that particular incarnation. Okay, so you mentioned that we set up memory triggers. What are memory triggers? Memory triggers are things that you resonate to in this life, but you don't know why. Okay. So in other words, like um, for me growing up, it was anything 18th century. I mean, as a child, I loved to listen to harpsichord music. I loved to write by candlelight with a feather pen and, and dip it in the ink. Uh, for Halloween, I was always dressed in like colonial clothes and my hair was in ringlets. And so I resonated to that time period, but I didn't have a clue why until many, many years later. Some people go to the same place every year on vacation and they don't know why. Uh, they, there's something about that place that just draws them. The same with, you know, you may love a certain kind of architecture. You may love or have an aversion to certain kinds of foods or cultures. Um, you know, I'd never go to that country. Ugh. You know, well, something negative may have happened to you there in a prior lifetime. So these things come up. Uh, the, the whole deja vu experience is a memory trigger. So they come up and, uh, and if, you, if you're uh, aware enough and you watch for synchronicities, you can get clues as to a past life identity through them. So some people uh, have memory triggers that are colors or others, uh, certain kinds of flowers or numbers. Certain numbers always appear repeatedly in their lives. So it's all around you and it's sort of built in. Uh, so when people say they don't remember their past lives, well, you're, you know, you've been sent here with enough clues that you can be a little detective and put it together. You don't even have to go through hypnosis to do it. So that's the beauty of it. So that's what memory triggers are all about. Wow, that is fascinating to me. And I haven't had a past life progression, but I can almost guarantee listening to what you just said that I had a significant past life. I don't know, 200 years ago or so living on a farm because for my entire life, I have been, I mean, I used to tell my parents, I've been born in the wrong time. I hate it here with all the technology. I want to live on a farm with animals and grow food. And I just feel like, that's who I am. Why Why is that not my life? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why I moved to Virginia. I grew up in Chicago and uh, that never felt like home to me. Mm. You know, I, I was like, where am I? Who are you people? <laughs> and, you know, and then uh, when I was in college, I majored in uh, history and in early American history. And I had a professor say, you have the most uncanny feel of the 18th century of any student I've ever had. And I thought, yeah, I know I do. I don't know why. And it wasn't until I actually came to Virginia and my soul let out this collective sigh of relief, like, oh, finally we're home, you know, and then it took me 25 years to move here. But um, but I did follow that yearning that I had to live where I lived before, you know. So, um, yeah, it's very powerful. Very, very powerful. So maybe someday you'll live on a farm. I hope so. I'm working towards it. I, yeah. Could you share more about that discovery for you? How did you end up realizing that you had a past life in the 18th century? Were you regressed or did you come about it some other way? It was a combination of a lot of things. Um, you know, it was my, as a child, my, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about how I was drawn to that time period. Uh, you know, I'd go to the library and I'd get books on Abigail Adams and those were my heroes. And uh, and uh, and when I got to college, I would ace all of my courses, uh, the um, writing the essays. Of course, I was using soul writing then um, and didn't realize I was writing from memory and not from what I had learned in the class. Uh, so I, I always felt this kinship with that time period. Um, and then, of course, 
when I got involved with ARE and with my own past life organization, I had past life therapists coming in and we did regressions and all. Um, yeah. I also had um, the first inkling, the first acknowledgement of, of who I had been was um, a friend of mine knew a, a channeler and she lived in Indianapolis. And, uh, and uh, I told my friend about my um, connection to feeling of a connection to this time period. And so she mentioned it when this woman went into a trance and then she said enough for me to start putting pieces together. And so after that, it was just going to reputable past life therapists uh, and or um, Akashic readers or, you know, people like that. And then of course, being involved with ARE, you're sort of uh, immersed in that life, in that belief. And so you can, you know, and then people started coming into my life who knew me in that time period or said they knew me in that time period. And so, and then I would somehow gain, gain recognition. And then, you know, I found a past life therapist that I really trusted and we, we did some work together on that life. And, uh, you know, and it just, it just proceeded from there. When I came here to Virginia and I went to, you know, some of the places I thought I had been before, I was having an emotional response to it. So it was a series, it had happened over many, many years. It wasn't just a one-time thing. It was a discovery a little at a time. And then using the soul writing as well, I was able, I teach people how to write with their past life aspect. So, you know, you can write with your, with the person you were before. You can ask questions in the soul writing and then get an answer. So there's a lot of um, avenues open to people who want to, discover information like that choose if they choose to do so so one of your books is called edgar casey and the unfulfilled destiny of thomas jefferson reborn that is a fascinating story and i know that we're a little bit short on time to get into such a big topic but could you briefly share the story of thomas jefferson yeah, um, in 1936, uh, Edgar Casey's uh, sec uh, secretary, Gladys Davis, her brother and sister-in-law had a baby boy. And that baby's mother and father were alcoholics. And so when the baby was born, they didn't expect him to live. So Gladys took the baby to Edgar Casey to do a life read, uh, I mean, a health reading on him. And Casey did and then saved his life uh, through this health reading. And during the reading, um, Casey said that this soul, the soul that was in this body, had been both Thomas Jefferson and Alexander the Great in a prior lifetime. And so uh, this little baby at two days old was told he had been, his parents had been told he had been Thomas Jefferson. So because the parents were gambling and, and, and alcoholics, they didn't really want to raise this little boy. So Gladys, the secretary, took the baby in and raised him. And he spent the first eight years of his life living in the Casey household. And during that time, you could read, if, um, if you're a member of the ARE, you could go to the Casey readings, look under 1208, that was his reading number, and you can read all the readings that Casey did with him. But my book, but Casey said in that reading about being Jefferson, he gave the um, prophecy that that soul could do for the world what Jefferson did for this country. Now imagine being told that when you're two days old. So everybody around him knew that he had been Jefferson and was watching you know, for signs that either he would remember that, that he would, you know, that he would uh, do this great thing for the world that Casey said he could. Of course, he, that never happened. Casey died when TJ was um, eight years old. And his whole life, if you read in the book, it's all about free will. It's all about choices that his parents made that took him on a different trajectory. Uh, but basically, um, he just died last month. Uh, he was 86 years old and he lived here in Charlottesville. Um, so he was a fascinating, fascinating man, but he had a, a really uh, not so great reputation. I think a lot of people expected him to do great things and he didn't. And they held him responsible for that. But my book is about why he didn't, about 
the role of free will in any given life. You could be told, you know, when you're born that you've got this lofty future ahead of you, but at any given time you can change your mind and you can go a different direction or, or whatever. And it, it, that's what happened with him. So, um, so yeah, I think the book, I'm actually proudest of that book. It took me eight years to write it. Uh, I did a lot of research in the, in the Edgar Casey foundation archives on him and, and he was my friend and I, I, uh, we had a close relationship too. So I, I very much miss him. And, um, and, and I'm glad that I was able to get that book done before he, he passed over. Wow, that is just fascinating. And I'm sorry for your loss with his passing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, he died May 7th, so it wasn't that long ago. Wow. He always told me he was going to live to 140, but maybe oh. next time. <laughs> maybe <laughs> next time he will. Not not this time. We were, we've been together in other lives, he and I. So I felt a real kinship uh, toward him. And I had made a promise in that pre-life planning session that I would write that book. Uh, and I got a lot of uh, a, a lot of grief from people who didn't want me to write that book. Uh, mm -hmm. But I felt that he needed to be vindicated. And, and the people had the wrong idea of him and were judging him, not understanding, you know, the role that his life was was taking, the, the trajectory that his soul wanted to go on. Uh, could we use a Thomas Jefferson right now? Oh, yes, absolutely. But that's not the way it was meant to be for him. So, um, mm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he was quite a character. So I'm guessing since you said that you, in the pre-birth planning session, you agreed to write the book that you must have known at before you came into the life that he may or may not choose to fulfill that purpose. I remember, I remember standing in front of the council of elders, I remember saying that I didn't want to do this. I thought, I think at the time that it had to do with the previous life that we had finished, that I, did, that I didn't want to write about that. So I wasn't sure at that point. That's what I thought the topic was. We come into this life. He was um, about 15 years older than me. And he had led quite a life by the time I met him. I met him when he was in his seventies, I think mm -hmm. he had quite the story. Um, but the more I talked to him and the more I understood, and I really think what Casey meant by you're going to do for the world, what Jefferson did for this country was that he was really meant to share the Casey teachings. He was meant to carry on the, the work because Casey Casey would teach him from the time he was two years old. He used to take him out on the pier. They'd go fishing together. And Casey, that was like his classroom. And Casey would teach him how to read auras. He taught him all about reincarnation. He taught him about karma. He told him the creation story. You know, every day they'd go out there and they're fishing. And Mr. Casey's pouring all this wisdom into the vessel of this little boy. You know, and why did he do that? I mean, I don't think he was teaching him anything about Thomas Jefferson. He was teaching him the, the whole metaphysical history of the planet and, and the way the universe operates. And I think that's what the intention was. But people misunderstood what Casey meant when he said that. And then they mm -hmm. persecuted him because he didn't live up to that prophecy. So. Right. The fact that he went out and he was talking about Casey was fulfilling that prophecy. And, and Lord only knows we had a lot of plans for him to continue to do that work. But in illness, all the role, and we weren't able to get it done this life. So maybe next time mm -hmm. we'll put it on the back burner. <laughs> again. <laughs> Although I don't know that I want to do this again. You know, So we'll see. We'll see. But he, he was a dear, dear soul. And I, I miss him very much. Well, Joanne, thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation and share your your life's work and experience and wisdom with us. i like to give you a chance to share where the viewers can find you, share about your books, your soul writing, anything else that you have going on. Well, thank you for that. Um, uh, if anyone's interested, you can go to my website, joannedimaggio.com. It's J-O-A-N-N-E-D-I-M-A. 
ggio.com. There's a little quiz on there that's kind of fun to see what kind of a regression would be best for you. I do offer several different types of regressions. You can read about them. You could book it online right on my website uh, the day that you, you know that you that you'd like the time that you'd like. Um, my books are all listed there. I've got one. The first one was on soul writing. The second one was on soul writing as pertaining to past life work. Then I've got the physical karma one, and I've got the one between lives, and then this one on Mr. Jefferson. So um, that's all there. And um, if you have any questions uh, pertaining to reincarnation or past life therapy, please send me an email. I'm happy to respond to you. You can send it to me right through my website. Perfect. I'll have all of those links in the description. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you, Melissa. I enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you for watching the Love Covered Life podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and comment with your thoughts and opinions and check the description box for the links to my free community where I share lots of resources, my pay what you can community where we do classes and challenges together, my TikTok, Instagram, my clips channel and lovecoveredlife.com where I share my paintings. Thank you so much for your support.